Uh, welcome to this afternoon's Australia at Home session, Campus Crisis, What is the Future of Our Universities? I'm Ben Eltham. Uh, I'm going to be hosting today's discussion and we're going to be looking at the future of Australia's universities. Well, as many of you are probably aware, due to some of the problems associated with the coronavirus pandemic, Australian universities are in something of a crisis, with a drop in international student enrolments sparking something of a collapse in revenue. Some people have compared it to a house of cards. The crisis highlights weaknesses in the sector, including the over-reliance on export dollars, the increasing casualization of the workforce and the creeping influence of corporate money. To coincide with today's National Day of Action by the National Tertiary Education Union to campaign for something to, something to happen about our university's crisis, I'm leading a discussion with some key sector leaders to talk about what we face and the future of our university sector. So I'm joined today by Alison Barnes. She is the president of the National Tertiary Education Union, and we're very pleased to have her. Also, Verity Firth. Verity is the Executive Director of Social Justice at the University of Technology, Sydney, and leads the newly established Centre for Social Justice and Inclusion at, the, at, at UTS. She is currently spearheading UTS's Social Impact Framework, a first of its kind in the Australian university sector. And we're also joined by Jamie Downey, Emeritus Professor in Economics from Victoria Uni. Jamie Downey is a veteran higher education analyst and has worked on both sides of the higher education industrial relations divide, both as a former state president of the NTU in Victoria and also as a negotiator for Victoria University in enterprise negotiations. So uh, it's a, quite a distinguished panel that we have today and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Uh, of course, uh, we sit, I sit uh, here in Melbourne on Indigenous land and I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, the, the elders of the land that I sit on, it's the Kulin Nation and I'd like to send my respects to the Indigenous elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we acknowledge that the land that I stand on, that I sit on here, uh, the sovereignty to that land was never ceded. Uh, I just want to go through a couple of the ground rules for today. The aim for today is for a, a uh, informal and collegial and enjoyable discussion. So we want it to be relaxed and inclusive. Uh, Peter Lewis has already made a joke about me wearing a shirt and tie, but actually it's just the first chance I've had to get out of my pajamas in six weeks. So um, everyone, I hope that you could bear with me on that. Um, if you could turn your screen to gallery mode on your top right corner and turn your cameras on, we'd love to see your smiling faces. Uh, there is an open chat on the Zoom app today, so feel free to introduce yourselves and um, to put in questions for the panellists. Um, if you ask your questions in the Zoom, then uh, the, uh, the people here at Essential Media will have a read of them and pass them on to me, and I will then be able to put those questions to the panellists. We are videoing today's session, uh, so we'd ask you all to play nice. Uh, I know many of you are passionate about the sector, uh, but this is a, a public forum. Uh, and so we'd ask you to uh, engage respectfully and collegially as you might hope to in a, a university conversation. Um, well, I'm gonna kick off uh, today's conversation where, with a with a question to Jamie Downey. Um, Jamie's uh, a veteran higher education analyst, as I've said, and he's someone who has run some numbers on the scale of the problems facing Australia higher education. Uh, Jamie, can you take us through what is the revenue shortfall for the Australian higher education sector in the current environment? Uh, Universities Australia, collected data from univers universities around the country. And they've put the figure for 2020 at about $4.6 billion, which is a pretty, a pretty big number. Uh, if you consider what that might mean for 2021, however, you start to get a little more scared. If international students aren't able to resume their activity in Australia. We're going to get something for 20, 
2020 and 2021, something in the order of between five and through to 10 or even more uh, billion dollars. Um, so you, you really begin to boggle at these numbers. Part of it is the direct fees that the international students pay, but some of it is other revenues that universities collect for, from international students, for example, for student housing and so forth. So you, you have to add all of those factors in to get the impact on the universities. Now, clearly some universities are hit uh, a little more than others are. For example, Ben, your university at Monash, which has got a huge uh, proportion of international students, the projected, and, and in fact, you look at the, 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 the figures there, Monash's revenue is about a billion dollars uh, thereabouts from, from international students. Now, if you imagine you're losing about half of that for 20, 2020 and 21, that's probably, that's assuming that we might not get international students back uh, early next year or in, in those sorts of numbers. The losses of about 50% or about five, $500 million is, is bigger than about, bigger than 10 of Australia's smaller universities in total. So you get an idea of the impact on university and therefore on the impact on university staff as well. So it's a massive uh, hit to revenue. Is it as simple as saying it's because the international students aren't coming or is there a further dimension there for domestic enrolments as well? Domestic enrolments, I think it's a little, it's a little too early to, to judge. Um, you often in a crisis where uh, universe and this certainly was the case during the, the GFC, although that was overlaid the, the beginnings of the demand driven system. So in the years following that, when unemployment gets a little higher, people tend to go back to university or enrol more in university. So the, the, the figures there are going to be a bit tricky. And I think we just wait on the answer to that. It may, may, it may be that uh, there is a slight increase in enrolments. So, um, you know, if we, if we say that the, the hit to revenue is, is something like four and a half billion dollars this year and perhaps double that next year, um, do we have any confirmed figures or some modelling about what the likely number of job losses might be associated with that kind of hit to revenue? Well, again, Universities Australia collecting data from the universities say unless something happens like the government comes in with support or um, universities buy into the um, jobs protection framework promoted by the NTU. Unless that happens, you, you look, you're looking at 21,000 jobs. That's the figure that's been, been presented based on, based on their calculations. So you, we're talking again, big numbers and, and a big impact. Um, but that assumes that nothing else happens. Now, I've estimated for, for the NTU, that the jobs protection framework, if universities buy into it, we may be able to save upwards of 12,000 jobs. Well, we'll, uh, we'll turn to the jobs protection framework perhaps uh, a little later in the, the discussion. But first, let's, um, I wanted to keep asking you, Jamie, um, what about JobKeeper? Uh, hasn't the federal government uh, designed a, a scheme to try and keep people in the workforce specifically because of this pandemic? They've designed a scheme that is aimed to keep a connection between uh, people who effectively stood down in their firms uh, during this crisis, but they've also designed a scheme to keep universities out of it, um, shifting the goalposts, as it were, uh, every time it became possible for universities to potentially gain access to that scheme for, for their employees. So right off the bat, it's been very clear that the government has said, we will give you what you've got now, the $18 billion revenue that you get for domestic students. That will flatline, that's flatline for you know, a couple of years now. We'll keep that. However, 
you're on your own for the rest. And they've been resolute in their determination to maintain that universities are going to suffer those, that any potential losses that comes from that other other revenue sources. Uh, it's been it's been clear and it fits in with an attitude of the coalition, which has been one of continued culture wars against uh, universities. And I think there was a very good article in the conversation by Gavin Moody yesterday that hit that point directly. Well, maybe I can bring in Alison Barnes uh, from the NCU now to discuss that. Uh, Alison, um, is, is that what it feels like to you? Do, do you feel like the universities are a victim of the government's culture wars? Thanks, Ben. Can I just begin by acknowledging we're meeting on traditional Aboriginal lands and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and say hello to all the excellent NTU members I can see out there, particularly my Queenslanders from my Women's Action Committee. It's lovely to see all of you there. Sorry for making that a bit personal for a second. Um, so governments attacking uh, universities, yes. $10 billion has been ripped out of our higher education um, institutions in the last decade which is absolutely appalling. And we're in a situation now in, with COVID-19 where the university sector has been hit and our private providers and our TAFEs um, and our Ellicott sector has been hit really early and really hard by COVID-19. So we're in a situation where we are already strapped with cash, you know, and we can speculate as to the reasons why that's the case, you know, ideology, all the issues, you know, that the, the current federal government has with our universities. But the federal government now is acting like COVID-19 isn't happening. So the federal government has made a decision for whatever reason to basically leave universities out to dry. So they released a funding package on uh, Easter Sunday, which was basically accounting tricks and provided no new money for Australian universities. So that means for staff across the sector, we're looking at, and it's 21,000 jobs, but that's FTE. So in reality, that's 30,000 jobs that will be lost. So that's 30,000 of our workmates looking at standing in queues at Centrelink in a year. That shocks me, you know, 30,000 people in the context of what looks to be a kind of great recession or depression, people standing um, in unemployment queues. And if you make universities smaller and less vibrant, that undermines universities' capacity to perform their core functions of teaching and research. I think for Australia to, you know, play the role, at Australian universities to play the role they should play in Australia's social and economic life. We need universities. We need vibrant spaces for education. And the government's willingness to leave us out to dry to whether this unprecedented crisis alone strikes me as astounding. Ben, you're on mute. There you go. Beginner's mistake there. <laughs> um, I will unmute myself now. Um, Verity, uh, you've worked in politics as well as in higher education. Um, do you agree that this is a, a populist, anti-intellectual kind of attack by the government? That We've had one question from the chat asking about that. Putting me on the spot. I don't think it's quite as simple as that. I, I definitely don't see the government as... Um, holding out the hand of friendship to universities during this COVID, during this crisis. And I think there's been some interesting pieces, including one that I read in the conversation today, talking about the antipathy towards ed, um, universities growing as universities essentially move from being elite institutions to more massified education or universalist models of education. And I think there is a, a um, ideological issue with that that the current government has. But I do think one of the fundamental problems that our sector has faced over the last maybe 20, 30 years even, has been a moving of the purpose or of the perceived purpose of the university to be all about creating individual value. So in the government's head and, and increasingly in society's head, going to university is actually about creating your individual value, which you're funding yourself through your hex and through your fees, and therefore, this sense that a university has a broader social purpose than, than that is lost. 
this actually lets governments off the hook in a lot of ways. If, if universities are simply a way that individuals increase their capacity to earn wages over their lifetime, why is there the same need for strong public investment? And similarly, because we've had such investment through the interna international students, the governments have been also let, let off the hook because there hasn't been the same political pressure around the funding of universities. Essentially, we have been funded and supported through international education. So I think this is a crux. I think this is a time that we all need to be thinking very seriously about what we think universities in the 21st century post COVID should look like. And what is our social mission? What is the public purpose? Why is it that we exist? Yes, well, I think that's a really interesting point, isn't it, Verity? Because at the same time that our universities have grown, they've enrolled more students, um, and they've been able to, to reach something like half of all school leavers now, um, they've also turned into quite big, big businesses, really, large organisations um, with big budgets and very prestigious, shiny buildings in the middle of our cities in many cases. Um, you know, is there, a, is there something of a dilemma here or a confusion at the heart of the contemporary university? They, the, on the one hand, they, they trumpet their, their role in Australia being centres of innovation, high-tech research, um, teaching students. But on the other hand, um, they seem extremely keen to enrol as many international students as possible and to try and bring in as much revenue as they possibly can. Yes, and I think there's been lots of commentary recently about the competition for international students also shifting the focuses of universities over time. If, you're, if so much of your revenue is dependent on international students, then there's a whole lot of things you need to do that you didn't used to need to do, such as climb the global rankings. What does that mean? Well, it means we need to invest in research. Oh, government isn't giving as much to research. Okay, what we'll do is put some of the international student revenue into our, to buttress our research to climb the global rankings. So yes, I think we're at a crossroads. I personally don't have a problem with massification of higher education, you know? I want as many people as possible to be able to access a university education, or at the very least, post-school training and education options that suit them, right? It'll suit their, what they want to do with their lives. Um, so that's not the problem. The problem is about universities grappling with the bigger piece around their public value, because I would argue Yes, a big part of our role absolutely is around educating individuals, and that's about personal uplift, and that's why you have to have access for low SES and Indigenous students. Of course, that's a big part of our mission, but another big part of our mission is actually is the creation of new knowledge, and it is um, the creation of a democratic polity, a civil society, the capacity for ideas to be discussed and spread, um, and, for, and for science <laughs> to be believed. I mean, I... I could go on forever. There is a fundamental role that universities play as public purpose institutions, and we need to once again seize that mantle. Absolutely. Um, but it's going to be hard to seize that mantle, isn't it, without some kind of improvement in public funding? Uh, maybe I can bring Jamie back in here. Um, over the last generation, Australia's public funding of universities has declined precipitately and we've tried to fill the gaps with enrolling more international students and trying to bring in more industry money. Jamie, do you have any numbers on the, the sort of level of, of funding that comes from, you know, com the government, say, compared to you know, student enrolments? Yeah, uh, the, obviously the proportion of government funding uh, of universities has declined at, precisely because the funding from private student fee paying has increased and that principally of course is international uh, student revenues so virtually from from nothing in the mid 1980s we've now built up in australia if you take everything into account a 40 billion dollar uh, industry um, exporting education services and that's across private ta private providers, TAFEs, universities, and so on. So it's big, but it's also got a component in it, which is the spending of international students when they're in Australia. So we can't merely just say, well, look, here's a problem with international student revenue. It has grown 
over this period to be part, of, uh, an essential part of Australia's uh, economy. So that's why a bit earlier, I guess I was trying to say, what possibly, what possibly could um, be motivating a government to burn an export industry like this? Um, and it, it, I think it comes down to, you know, giving a slap to universities and also fitting in with the, the coalition's attitude towards, um, you know, Australia first. Let's put it in, in inverted commas. It's a sort of a quasi-Trumpy Australia first sort of attitude, not wanting to be seen to be helping out uh, international students. So there's a, a fair bit of that there. Now, I've just deviated from the, the particular uh, question that you asked, Ben, but let me let me come back to it. The couple of big facts about Australian universities. One is the growth in international student revenues. So that's about 26% of all revenues on average of Australian uh, universities uh, at the present time. So that's, that's one big fact. The second big fact is the growth of student revenues, not only from international sources, but also from domestic sources with the demand driven system, which from the periods of 2011, 2012, through up until about 2016, 17, when it starts to, to taper off, we've got a growth in domestic students. So there's been a substantial growth in student numbers from domestic and international sources. In fact, the growth proportionately has been something like 55% of the growth has been from domestic students, 45% of the growth has been uh, from international students. So that places in the university's budgets a massive increase as well in the proportion of student revenues to total revenues. Now, what you would expect to see with that is a proportionate increase going to teaching. Now, the second big fact about universities is that teaching hasn't grown. The resources devoted to teaching in universities have fallen as a, in parallel with this growth in student revenues. Now, what, how have they coped? Well, the answer is simple. You increase sessional employment. And so sessional employment um, in the teaching space has increased right through that same period as student revenues has, have grown as a proportion of uni university uh, revenues. Now, that to me is one of the biggest public, public, public policy problems that universities face going into the period after COVID. It's been a problem before, it's a problem now, it will be a problem afterwards. And the refocusing of university spending to prioritise teaching is, one, is going to be one of the most important issues I think uh, the university should face. I might just bring Alison in quickly there, um, particularly to talk about that, that issue around the casualisation of the university workforce. It's a, a very insecure and precarious workforce now, isn't it, Alison? Uh, universities, are, so many staff across universities are employed so precariously. Over 50% of teaching at our institutions is performed by people with no employment security. And we have uh, large sections of our general and professional staff who are also employed uh, precariously. So, for example, in COVID-19, when I said earlier, hit our sector really early and really hard, you saw those first waves hit our Ellicott uh, centres and our private providers. But, you know, Newcastle, Newcastle, gym for, Newcastle University, for example, closed its gym. 100 people lost their jobs there. So our casuals, um, our academic casuals have certainly been at the forefront of losing work during COVID-19, but as so have our professional and general staff. So we have a university model that is built on the back of insecurely employed labour. And this is absolutely terrible for people who are stuck in these continuous cycles of precarious employment. It makes them um, financially vulnerable. Um, it makes them emotionally vulnerable. And universities have a business model which treats people so they need to be dependable, but they're also disposable. And it's, it's the hallmark of our current um, system. And it's such a blight on the system. It undermines so many fundamentals of university life. If you, if you want academic freedom, right, the cornerstone of Australian universities, 
you need people with employment security. So it comes at a terrible cost for the individual and it undermines, I think, the core functions of universities. So it is a huge blight on our sector. Um, now, I've got a question here from the audience. Uh, this one is from Matthew Dunn at Deakin University. Uh, Matthew, um, just wait for us to unmute you and um, I, think you, I think you're good to go. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, I live in inner city Melbourne and in a 20 kilometre radius, there's about five or six universities and that's not including the satellite campuses that some other universities have. So my question is, do we have too many universities in Australia and are they in the right places to serve um, the people of Australia and other people coming into the country? And I should say that I'm a teaching and research academic, so um, I like universities because they employ me. Well, I might, I might ask Verity there as someone who's from a very inner city university. Yes, and, and like you, I'm at UTS and we have Notre Dame about three minutes away and Sydney University about six minutes away. And I have been thinking about the question around the number of universities. There are two things I would say to that. I don't know the answer about whether we have too many universities. I think as a sector, probably we do need to specialise more, like we need to have universities with different specialties so that there is more diversity and people choose to go to the university that most suits their interests. Um, you know, University of Technology Sydney really should be a university of technology, perhaps, and other universities focus on their other research strengths and teaching strengths. The other thing I would say, too, is that we often underestimate the... Um, the role of universities as anchor institutions in communities, as real generators of economic um, opportunity in their own right. And those, that is particularly true for regional universities. And it's particularly true, true for some of those universities like Western Sydney that sit in the heart of a big, clearly defined geographic area and produce a lot of employment and opportunity for that area. So I do think that is another role that universities play and seeing them also as a tool to actually drive economic development more broadly, I think would also um, help answer the question about where they should be. You're mu muted, Ben, you're muted. Just have to leave it on, won't I? Um, uh, either of my other two panellists want to jump in on that one? Maybe Jamie, did you, did you have a thought on the sort of concentration of the, the universities or the their specialization or lack thereof? Yeah, well, and a Verity's point about um, university diversity, that was one of the big arguments for increasing the marketization of education right throughout the last uh, couple of decades. So the idea was that we would have competition between universities and that would lead to more diverse institutions picking up niche markets in various areas and so on. So that was, a pl that was the theory. But in fact, what, what competition has meant is that you have got replica universities competing for essentially the different chunks of the, the student market with the more status, uh, the higher status universities picking up what they see as the, the higher calibre students and so forth, people that are ATARs and, 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 and so forth. But what you've seen with it as well is universities competing with each other in, in virtually the same structural patterns. So you have every university's got to have this, every university's got to have that, every university's got to have that. It, it seems to me to be a, a form of perverse competition where you actually looking at it from perhaps an economist's point of view, you, you, you actually get inefficiencies built into the system. So, for example, we have eight universities operating out of the city of Melbourne. Um, surely you could run one payroll system. I'm just speculating about that. You know, the public service operates on one payroll system, but we have to have this form of universities in competition with each other, having the same structural, essentially the same structural basis. Uh, there are so many reasons that we can 
ascribe destructive competition to the way universities are currently established. Now, does that mean that we've got too many of them? That's a, an open question, but I, I think something that's not such an open question is, as a result of this crisis, some of the smaller universities and more vulnerable universities are going to be pushed into a situation where mergers are right on the agenda. Could I jump in there, Ben? Yeah, not just quickly, because I, I want to get to some more questions from the audience. Well, not only mergers, but the closure of potential regional campuses. You know, re regional universities add so much to the life of their communities. And we're looking at a crisis where we're looking at universities potentially closing campuses in our regional areas. And that has a terrible impact on those communities. You know, universities are sources of employment, but they add to the life of community. And this is one of the things that really disturbs me, those threat, threats to those regional campuses. We had Central Queensland come out the other day, who's our biggest regional university, saying it was looking at losing one in five jobs. Yeah, that's, that's very concerning indeed. Um, well, actually on that, we actually have a question from the audience. Uh, Jackie Hewitt uh, had a question for the panel. Uh, Jackie, if we can get your question, um, have a go. Okay, yes, I'm unmuted now <laughs> and freezing in the scenic rim. Actually, that sounds a little rude, but there is actually a place called the scenic rim. <laughs> I love Southeast Queensland, don't worry. <laughs> um, yes, the question really is about um, whether there's any intel as to how universities will choose staff who are made redundant. Uh, will it be linked perhaps to, you know, student numbers in specific areas or will it be some other mysterious process that has no transparency at all? Well, it might be best to ask Alison that. Maybe you've got some intel as the union boss. Just uh, muting myself, sorry, I wish I had more intel. Um, look, I think the thing is we want these processes to be as transparent as possible. One of my deep fears is that management will use the COVID crisis to pick off particular groups that, um, you know, to get rid of, for example, um, profitable departments um, that are really valuable in the arts and life as part of that kind of attack we see going in our areas like arts. I also really worry about management using these sorts of crisis to, to target activists. There's a whole, I suppose, slew of issues around transparency and the need for it, which I think emerges from the COVID crisis. Um, so one of the things that you've done as the union president is to try to negotiate a deal with the universities, haven't you? You've tried to negotiate with vice chancellors some kind of arrangement that you're calling the job protection framework that would actually cut the wages of university workers in order to save jobs. And I understand that's been quite controversial amongst the many union members. Can you explain what the idea of the jobs protection framework is, Alison? Yeah, sure. It's a temporary variation to an enterprise bargaining agreement. So it lasts for a year. So it's a temporary variation at which point when it ends, conditions revert to the status quo. So the thinking behind the a jobs protection framework is, you know, the sector is in this unprecedented crisis. We are looking at losing, as I said earlier, 30,000 jobs and we're really worried about where those jobs will go from and the impact um, on women in particular and vulnerable workers across the sector. So we're in this unprecedented crisis and I think when you're in those situations, not only do we need to, I suppose, save jobs, as I said earlier, I have nightmares about 30,000 of our workmates and colleagues standing in unemployment queues. But we also need to, I suppose, ensure the sector is robust and maintain its vitality. Like I think a big sector and a vibrant sector is the way to go. And so when you're looking at job losses, you're not only looking at the terrible impact on the individual. We know people who lose their jobs may never re-enter the workforce. We know that early career researchers you know, a whole generation of early career researchers may be lost. So there are all these terrible, terrible impacts on the individual. But I'm also really worried about the sector being softened. So the sector is smaller and weaker and less able to resist, I suppose, um, attacks on its purpose, you know, that it will be reshaped in ways that I don't think necessarily represent the interest of students or staff or the Australian community. So if you look back to that uh, Easter Sunday package that the government um, related, there was 
a series of there was there's measures in there around small courses now small courses can be good but they're all about employability they're not necessarily about the development of critical thinking skills and we really need i believe critical thinking skills are, are central to employability but they're also central to i suppose civil society and um democracy so to, to i suppose move back to the jobs protection framework which was what you asked me about ben the, uh, the jobs protection framework is aimed at developing a mechanism, a temporary mechanism to ensure that we have as many as as many as our work as our workmates as possible employed during what looks like it's going to be a very deep um, and lasting recession. Um, Verity, uh, I believe uh, your university has already said no to the jobs protection framework. So uh, no pay cuts for you, uh, but does it concern you that the, the likely result of that is that there might be now significant redundancies at your university? Well, I've got to hope, obviously, that that's not the case. Um, the reason our university, I feel, I don't really speak on behalf of UTS in any of course, way. No, we, oh. we understand that. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason that um, uh, our vice chancellor is given is that they don't expect job cuts and that they don't believe in the context of their forward financial planning that they will need um, to, to reduce wages in order to save jobs. So that's what we've been told. Um, and it's definitely true to say, as someone who's directing a centre um, with a whole lot of staff at it, um, like any manager, I think, in this process, I'm nervous, um, but I just believe what I've been told, which is at the moment, the priority is around maintaining our jobs, ensuring that all of the cost saving that we're doing is linked to maintaining jobs. So where we're cutting costs through in a way that most other, I'm sure all other universities are done, like we've, all our capital works have been cut, all of our non-salaried expenditure has been completely um, wiped out basically for 2020. We're just hoeing down and um, preserving jobs. So that's my fingers crossed. So if I could jump in for a second, Ben. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. The, the jobs protection framework really stops people doing, it doesn't force management to cut anybody's wages, but it does force them to guarantee that they're not going to stand down workers without pay, that they're not going to make people redundant. And it does for, force, and Jamie might talk more about this, university management to open their books so that their financial data is transparent and available. And I think that's very threatening for, um, for many vice chancellors. And I suppose I also have a deep fear that universities like UTS or Melbourne University will go and seek to move their own variations, which the federal government, and I think what I can use technical industrial relations language like in a complete dog act, has made very, employer, very easy for employers to do. So they can move to very awards, they can give 24 hours notice and they can open those um, ballots for 10 minutes. Now those, variations to agreement have no union input. They have no employee voice. So we're seeking really to restrain the power and prerogative of management. Our industrial relations laws really slate the power towards management. So we've been working very hard, as I said, to save jobs, but also to put some checks and balances on, man on, on managerial prerogative. Well, just um, hold up on that. Let's uh, because we've got a question here from Felicity, uh, one of our audience members. Felicity, um, it, uh, I believe she had a question. Um, I wonder if we can get her to ask. No. All right. So I'm going to read out uh, Felicity's question. So her question was, Alison, what makes you think conditions would revert to normal after the crisis? We give up pay and do the same hours we will never get the pay back. So because, it's a question really about how, how you know, given the, the concessions that are gonna be given up here. Um, it's a question we've been asked a lot uh, because it's a temporary variation to an enterprise bargaining agreement. So at the end of that year, things must resort, resort, resort to the status quo. So it's temporary. It's, it's, a, it's an industrial instrument. It's the enterprise bargaining agreement. So at the end of that year, things have to, revert to the status quo. If, if it was ongoing and untemporary, there's no way we would have done it. Things have to re, uh, revert to normal. We 
just trying to hold things together for a year to sort of see us through the worst of COVID and then things um, revert to normal. Uh, we have a question here from Richard Brown. I'm just going to keep asking questions from the chat. Uh, Richard Brown has asked, um, he's, it's a question about unis liquidating assets uh, to cover revenue shortfalls in the short run. Um, maybe I can pose that to Jamie. Um, it, it, universities own some very, very nice pieces of real estate, don't they, Jamie? Um, so uh, isn't there an opportunity for them to maybe sell off some of those assets to make up some of the shortfall here? Yeah, potentially, potentially. Um, I, I wouldn't um, prescribe that as a universal, um, a universal uh, option, um, but it's certainly possible in, in some university circumstances. But the point being, it, and people should bear this in mind in consi when considering the, the um, uh, NTU job saving package, is that they're one-offs. You sell off a building, you've sold off the building. What happens with the decline in international student revenue and the revenues associated with it is it attracts through the system. It doesn't just stop once you lost, say, the, the 4.6 billion in 2020. That 4.6 billion goes through 2021, 2022. We have the pipeline effect and that gets added to by any additional pipeline effects for 2021 declines in student revenue and so forth. So those continue, continue through, which means that the universities at a certain point are going to have to look at um, other forms of reduction. And we know that the biggest forms of reduction are reductions in, uh, in staffing. And it makes particularly the most vulnerable of the university employees um, even more vulnerable. So sessional employees, sessional teaching, casual, non-teaching um, staff and so on are the ones who get hit. And the jobs preservation, jobs protection package of NTU aims to correct that now, or at least not correct it, it, it aims um, to uh, limit the damage. And I think that's probably the, a better way, of, uh, better way of describing it. Um, I, apparently, uh, Richard would like to respond to that. So we'll, uh, we'll give him a sec to see if we can uh, get him online. Uh, Richard, can you, can you hear us? Um, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, fire away, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks. No, the, yeah, the issue is, I mean, yes, I know that, you know, you couldn't cover the complete shortfall, but has this been on the agenda at all? I haven't heard any discussion of this. And in a recent um, you know, management meeting that I attended at my university, I was told explicitly that the cuts were there to preserve the current rate of profit. Um, so it seemed to me that the universities are not prepared to take a cut in profit and therefore the full burden of the cut in revenue has to be put onto operating costs. And this seems rather strange to me because I don't think private sector behaves in that way. Very good question. Would any of our panelists uh, be prepared to, to answer that one? Um, the the uh, job protection framework um, actually requires universities to have gone through other measures before reaching the point of, of uh, approaching pay roll reductions or time fraction uh, reduction. So in answer to Richard's question, uh, all of those measures for universities buying into the jobs protection uh, framework are, are totally on the agenda. But are they selling off any assets at all? Uh, Sorry, Jamie, you go. No, no, go on, go on, go on, Alison. No, you go. It, it potentially, if they've got the assets to sell. I mean, obviously there, there, there will be um, financial assets that will be, be drawn down during that period. Um, most, most certainly, that that's the first. That's what happens in the first instance. You draw down cash. They um, have to demonstrate that they've made non-staff saving costs first, and that's assessed by a national expert, which is half union, half management, and an independent chair. So that's when we have people like Jamie, who are sort of you know 
have you know forensic educate forensic accounting skills to go through their books and make sure that they have taken those savings in the first instance from excessive and obscene vice chancellor remuneration from uh, you know stopping building from a whole range of other sources before they touch staff so i'll um, i've got to keep us moving here um so what i'm going to do now is I'm going to ask the panel to turn their minds to the future uh obviously we're in a bit of a tricky spot right now uh but universities are hundreds of year old institutions um, and I'm sure we can agree that there'll still be universities in the far future. The question I think is what sort of universities, what sort of educational institutions are they going to be? So uh, perhaps I'm going to ask the, the panel, uh, perhaps I'll start with Verity. Do you, wh what do you think is the, the future for, the, for our universities? Do they still have a role in things like social impact and the kind of equity issues that you study? Or are they going to turn into glorified tech academies or micro-credential institutions? Yeah. Of course, they still have a role in equity um, and social impact. They have an incredible role. I'm going to use this as an opportunity for a plug for one of my colleagues' podcasts. Her um, associate professor, Tamsin Peach, here at UTS, has um, launched a podcast called The New Social Contract, which is all about what is the vision for universities post-COVID. And the first episode is particularly interesting because it goes through the fact that the contract or what she calls the social contract between universities, the public and the state has changed a number of times, even just over the last century. So whether it be about purely about skilling up the professions, whether it be more like the Whitlam-esque um, broader benefit to society offered through free education, the contract is constantly shifting and changing and can be remade again. So listen to that podcast. At the f very first crux, I suppose what I want to do first cab off the rank, though, is about equity and access. I think one of the biggest problems we're going to have with COVID is that it will, it already has impacted on different parts of the population very differently. So we've already seen women suffer more, we've already seen young workers suffer more, we've already seen people from other countries, international students, but also temporary protection visa holders, all of those people suffer more. So what we don't want to do in any COVID recovery is compound that discrimination even further. So I think universities in the first instance need to be at the forefront of an inclusive recovery. I know that Oxford University are doing things around equality impact statements in all public policy, but also I think we need to be saying at every step of the way, we need to be ensuring equal access. Now, I know James was saying, um, we don't really know what's going to be happening to the domestic student demand yet. And there is a bit of, we don't really know yet. But what we know from history is that during times of recession, more likely than not, domestic demand will increase as people ride out the recession in education and training. And unless we actively make sure that we are implementing policies that support low SES student entry, Indigenous student entry, students from remote and regional entries, those students will not be able to compete in a capped and confined and competitive environment. So I think at the very least, we should be looking at an education and training guarantee in the immediate years after COVID, and that we should be saying once again, let's return to demand funding, um, at least for the first three to five years post COVID. Um, but that's just a few things right. I could talk forever. Let's, well, well, okay. let's, Let, let's unpack that a little bit, Verity. Um, so a little bit of jargon there for some people who don't know the higher education sector. Um, when you talk about the, the demand driven system, this was the old system implemented under the Rudd Gillard government where basically um, universities were given as much uh, university funding as for in, as the number of enrollments basically. So the number of students determined their uh, domestic funding. So you would like to see a return to that system where by, uh, we open up uh, enrollment for our domestic students to as many who want to go to universities. Is that, is that right? Yes, I would. And I would have it as an education and training guarantee, which included an opening up for post-secondary options such as TAFE and um, vocational training as well. Um, it's interesting because I know demand funding driven funding is controversial, but the biggest increases that we have ever seen in participation of low SES, Indigenous, students with a disability has ha happened during demand funding. Absolutely no doubt about it. There's a whole range of reasons for that, including the sort of 
the way that the ATAR is skewed toward higher SES, you know, high ATARs are skewed towards high SES populations, etc. But for whatever reason, that system actually drove the participation of key equity cohorts. And I think in a, in a capped environment with increased competition and with high unemployment, unless we're really interventionist about making sure there's equal access to education and training opportunities, inequality will just grow and grow worse and worse. Because as we know, when there's hardly any jobs to go around, it's going to be people who are skilled up that are going to be able to access those jobs. So, um, I, and I think for universities, if we're talking about what is our public purpose and what is our role at times like this, to be the champions of opening up the system for mass access, I think would also put us in a very good stead. Maybe uh, some of either of our other panelists would like to jump in there. What do you guys think about not just the demand driven system, but the future of our university sector more broadly? Can I jump in, Alison? Yeah, yeah, yes, you please. Go. Yeah. Look, uh, um, Verity's point, I, I agree with him entirely. Uh, but that means once you start expanding the base of your, your education system, letting more students in, correspondingly, you have to increase the emphasis on teaching and delivering good quality education to those students. Um, what short courses don't do it, micro credentials don't do it. What you need is good quality degree level studies for students that help those from a low SES background, those students who have low entry level ATARs, we call it ATARs, but very often we have direct entry into universities of people who are not as prepared as some other um, students who go into university are prepared. So what you need to do is put the emphasis on teaching. Uh, I think that reorientation of our university focus is required. Does that mean that we downplay research? No, it doesn't. I, I think that research um, and the allocations to research, if you look, actually look at the numbers, they're not that big um, in a university context. They're a, a, a relatively small proportion of both CSP funding and international student funding. So the, we can we can do we can increase the emphasis on teaching, as well as increase the emphasis on quality research. But uh, it does mean that we have to look overall at our university structures in ways that enable us to do it. It means looking at non employee spending, for example, which has increased probably more than the other uh, expenses within the university. It means looking at attempting to get efficiency gains in all other areas of, of, of university. Uh, I think that's, that's the sort of thinking that we need to be placing on the agenda for a post-COVID world. Um, a post-COVID world in which we hope we expand entry to universities and particularly low SES entry. I think Verity and Jamie have talked really eloquently about the role that our universities play in transforming people's lives and their absolute importance. So I absolutely share large parts or parts of both of their, their vision, of, although there might be some difference around the edges. Um, but I suppose whilst agreeing with that i also have for at the front and center of my mind the need for in staff across universities to be employed securely we can't have those things as i said earlier academic freedom those cornerstones of australian university are undermined by the insecurity and precarity of the labor force covid 19 has really writ large the fundamental problems with the university's business model that the costs are worn by those who are at the really at the receiving it at this point, our casuals, you know, staff across our sector. So for my mind, of course, you know, we need universities need to be robust, they need to be vibrant places, they need people need access to education because education transforms life. I believe passionately in education, but I also believe that the industrial relations of our university need to be fair and they are as it stands, they are 
industrial relations, the way casual is treated is fundamentally unfair and broken across our higher education system. So I would like that inherent inequity to be fixed in a post-COVID world. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question, um, at least. Uh, we'll try and get to maybe a, a, a final, final question if, if we can. But um, well, I'm going to ask uh, Marcus Foth at QUT um, if he'd like to ask a question to the panel. Yes, um, thank you, Ben. Um, I was um, part of a previous um, forum, discussion forum that was organized by the NTU where the comment was made that um, if we were to consider more radical action, more you know, community activism, it's going to be quite risky because compared to some other industry sectors, the public perception of universities is probably much lower. And so my question to the panel is if they could comment on the, the role of the news media in being complicit in turning the public's perception against academia. Um, I'm particularly thinking of examples of scandals over a number of years now that have come and then they went without really any adequate repercussions against the federal government. And in fact, it was largely Rupert Murdoch and the News Corp, a machinery of propaganda that has turned that public perception into even more negativity. I'm thinking of, of Lomborg in 2015 with Tony Abbott, um, Malcolm Turnbull's war on maths in 2017, the whole interference in the independence of the ARC's um, peer review process in 2018, the Ramsey discussion in 2019, and more recently, um, the censoring of, of CSIRO colleagues providing scientific advice on the Adani coal mine. And in all of those instances, the, the public perception of academia has, if anything, become even worse, um, rather than there being any repercussions around uh, this, this terrible federal government that is um, coming after us. Yeah, that's a great final question, Marcus. Well, what I might do is go around the panel um, for a, a final answer from all three of our panelists, which will probably take us more or less up to our time this afternoon. Um, I do want to thank Marcus for that question. Um, perhaps I'll start with Verity. So I agree, Marcus, and I think particularly the role of the Murdoch press over, you know, 10, 20, 30 years um, has been a real problem. I think, I mean, I think it goes even broader than just universities, really. It's about an attack on scientific truth and scientific method. And I think personally that it, it first came to a head because of climate change. So basically a whole lot of very wealthy, very invested um, people um, wanted to oppose climate change. And in order to do that, had to start attacking scientific truth. And what's happened over time is this sort of distrust of, true, of science, distrust of the elites has also then been conferred upon universities as well. Um, so I think it's a huge problem. Um, I'll, give, I'll try to give some positive. It is true to say that universities still do maintain good reputations. So when you look at those sort of rep track data and things, even though like politicians are 20% and, you know, used car salesmen are 10%, universities and university professors do, do still have ratings of between 70 and 80% in terms of being trusted by the community. So, so I don't think we need to give up yet. It is just the media, it isn't the community. And I think as far as universities are concerned, how do we maintain that reputation? Well, it is also about maintaining that trust. So yes, making sure that you um, deliver unbiased, free, um, clever, evidence-based research, but it's also about making sure that you as a university are engaged in your local communities and, are, and there's a two-way flow of information and a, a two-way flow of knowledge. So I think there's lots of ways that universities can also help themselves by, um, by, by engaging um, and outreach and all of the thing, great things we do, but um, I don't want us to give up. People do still like us, it's just the media. Jamie. Uh, yeah, this is gonna, gonna sound um, a bit strange perhaps, but it, it sort of echoes um, Verity's comments. Universities also should just be careful not to appear in the public um, mind as being too flash by heart. Um, and when I look at the news reports today that vice chancellor of salaries, the average is above a million per annum. I, I think that's not a good look in the community, frankly. Um, CEO salaries in general are not a good look 
uh, in the community, but it looks worse for a university. And so try, try to be just a little more modest in the way we, are, uh, we present our public demeanour uh, is going to be important for public reputation as well. Alison. Oh, Jamie mentioned the issue of vice chancellor's remuneration, and I got all cross and distracted and <laughs> moved on from Marcus's excellent question, where he distracted me by talking about the federal government because we're having our national day of action today to campaign uh, for the federal government to give us funds that we need uh, to ensure that job security and our teaching and research is is healthy and prosperous across um, Australian universities. Yeah, so I do think. Um, we sometimes have an image problem, which we as a union, as one of our kind of campaign, because we've got to fight very hard around these issues, we really seek to bring, I suppose, the general public with us because of the absolutely vital role that our members play in, you know, educating Australia's international and domestic students. So, you know, I think we should be out and proud. I'm so proud to have worked in a university for most of my working life. You know, I think we should be out and proud and defend our institutions because, Higher education in this country matters deeply to me, you know. So I couldn't agree with you more, Marcus. I think it's a great question. I think our government is anti anti universities and anti unions, <laughs> which is a bit of a perfect storm for us. Well, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up our conversation. Uh, we have clicked over to the hour now. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists and indeed all of our audience members for some very stimulating questions and for a respectful and interesting debate today. So join me in uh, the electronically clapping uh, Alison Barnes, uh, Verity Firth and Jamie Downey. I'd also like to thank Hannah, our tech support person, and of course, Peter Lewis at Essential. Uh, before we go, I do have to do a little bit of thank yous. Uh, the Australia at Home sponsors, of course, Essential Media, Principal Co, Guardian Australia, the Centre for Australian Progress and the Community Council of Australia. And we would be very remiss if we didn't mention tomorrow's lunchtime conversation. Is COVID a laughing matter? This, look, this one looks like a cracker with uh, Dan Illich, Mark Humphreys, Jen Fricker and Daniel Stone. That's a bit of an all stars of comedy. That looks like a very lighthearted and enjoyable conversation indeed. Uh, but from now, uh, I think it's goodbye from the panel and it's goodbye, goodbye from me, Ben Eltham. Um, I hope to see all of you online, no doubt. I'll see some of you around about Melbourne as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.